The important thing is our mission hasn't changed. We're still focusing on helping people connect and finding communities and grow businesses. We've just very clearly put a stake in the ground around what we believe is the future and more and more that's going to take place in the metaverse. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier weekly podcast that dissects the pulse of business, technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung and recently, Facebook has been rebranded into Meta and will shift their strategy from connecting the world to building the metaverse. To help me make sense of what it means for Meta in Asia Pacific, I have Dan Yeri, Vice President of Asia Pacific Meta on the show to share his perspectives on this major shift. Dan, welcome to the show. It's really good to be here. Thank you so much. This interview has been a long time coming. And as it is in our tradition to ask our first time guests, how did you start your career? Well, I'm originally from the US and I began my career as a brand manager for the Kellogg company. So focused on breakfast cereal. And early on, I had a really pivotal moment that happened that really helped shape the rest of my career. I was offered the opportunity at Kellogg to go help out for a 10 month period to do a startup of the Korea business. And you know, that's probably not the best of ideas from a career perspective because it means leaving the headquarters, but it felt like a great adventure. I did it. And uh, that 10 months has turned into 30 years later. I have spent the majority of my life in Asia. That was really the point at which my love affair with Asia, the people, the culture, the food really began. And so ultimately I left the breakfast cereal industry and moved into technology right exactly when the, the internet was starting to take off. So my, my timing was impeccable. I did a startup in Silicon Valley. Eventually I ended up moving back to Asia and was really early on in helping uh, scale what turned out to be some major tech companies across the region. So we're very fortunate in that regard. I've been at Meta for about the last nine years. Prior to that, I was at Skype and prior to that, I was at eBay. That's right. Since you have been transversing from the US to Asia Pacific, I want to ask you, what are the key lessons from your career journey that you can share with my audience? Well, I think we could probably do an entire podcast series on the lessons that I've picked up along the way. Uh, not all of them easy ones, by the way, but I'll share two. The first one is as much an observation as it is a lesson. And that is that the early stage of your career, your life, you're really focused around assimilation. You know, how do I look like everyone else? How do I fit in? How do I understand facts and memorization? And then you really realize later on in life that most often success is correlated with the opposite. It's, it's focused around differentiation. What makes you or your business unique and special? And I just really wish I would have learned that earlier in my life so I could spend a, a little less time trying to fit in and more time trying to celebrate the differences. The second lesson that I would put out there is that the opportunity that are presented to us on this journey of life and our journey of our careers, it often trumps just having a very rigid plan. And what I mean by that is, look, if you're like me, you've determined in, back in uni what your career is gonna be, it's probably from a very limited number of choices and you're gonna go from manager to senior manager to director. And you know what, life just doesn't work out that way all the time. And in fact, some of the best aspects of it are the opportunities that come along. And I go back to even uni in my own case, I would have never envisioned that I would be doing the role that I am right now, but I'm certainly very grateful to my younger self that uh, I made that bold decision to accept that temporary role in Korea that ended up changing my life and my career. Totally agree. I guess life is always full of surprises. Before we start the conversation on the main subject of the day, I'd like to baseline our conversations with a key understanding of two concepts. The first, creator's economy, and the second, metaverse. Can you provide a definition of what these two concepts mean to the general audience out there from your perspective? Sure, I'll start out with the creator economy. And you know, the reality is anytime any of us are putting things out there in the world, we're technically a creator, but the creator economy is something very specific. And it really refers to the ecosystem around creators and how they're monetizing their work and, and their creations. And so that could either be what they're doing with a brand or a sponsor or monetizing through ads or subscriptions and could even be selling things like NFTs. 
who knows? Moving over to the metaverse. The way that I think about the metaverse is it's the next evolution of social connection and technologies. Said in a very simple way, and I, I have to explain this to my 11-year-old son, so I, I try and make it very simple. Look, it's a set of virtual spaces where you can get together and explore with other people even though you are not there. And if I think about the context for how this has all evolved, I go back to when I first started using the Facebook app. And when I first started using the Facebook app, you know, it was social connection driven largely by what took place on a desktop. And it was mostly using text. That was the way that you communicated. And then along came the mo mobile and phones had built-in cameras and you started to see an explosion of something that was a lot more visual. That's really when Instagram came on. And then if you look at where we're at today, videos. Videos are booming. It's the heart of how so many of us are, are connecting. But the important thing of that journey is that it doesn't really stop here. And so the metaverse is it's a more immersive experience. And on, on many levels, you're moving from what are now two dimensional experiences to three dimensional. So you're feeling somebody's presence, even though you might be on the other side of the world. Thank you for helping me with these definitions. So that comes to the main subject of the day, Meta in Asia Pacific. Meta is now the new brand that encompasses Facebook and the other key services, for example, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Oculus, and I think Novi as well. Can you briefly share what Meta is now and the company's vision for the metaverse? Sure. So first, let me talk about the brand. And there were really two things that came around. And so it was a, a bit of a confluence. You know, the first one is you look at where we started. We started around the Facebook app and everything that we did was related to that Facebook app. But if you look at where you're at today, and this was in your question, frankly, there's just a lot more. There is Instagram, there's WhatsApp, there's Messenger, there's Novi, there's Workplace, and there's a range of other things. It's a, a collection of technologies, but it's more than just the Facebook app. And then you look at what we believe the future represents, and we are deeply committed. We believe deeply in the metaverse that it's the future of social connections. And we're a technology company, and we're building for that. And so the name Meta really was the embodiment of both of those challenges in, in, in our attempt to, to take it forward. And the important thing is our mission hasn't changed. We're still focusing on helping people connect and finding communities and grow businesses. We've just very clearly put a stake in the ground around what we believe is the future and more and more that's gonna take place in the metaverse. Now, one key thing that I always try and communicate to people because I get questions on, well, you know, tell us a little bit about this metaverse that you're building. We're not building the metaverse, we're building for the metaverse. I always use the analogy of the internet. It's not owned by any one company. There are many companies, developers and creators that are all building for the metaverse and certainly we wanna be one of them. So what does this new vision of building the metaverse for Meta mean for Asia Pacific then? Well, for starters, we believe that the metaverse is one of the single biggest opportunities for modern business since the creation of the internet. And if you look at Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific has always been ahead of the curve when it comes to digital adoption. And you combine that with the fact that you've got two thirds of the world's population that are here in Asia Pacific. And we really think this evolution could be pretty profound in this region. And it, you know, it's not a, a big stretch. If you look at the speed by which entire industries in Asia Pacific have adapted to things like mobile or messaging, it's not far-fetched at all to imagine that the same thing is going to happen with the metaverse. But we're realists. We also know that there's some technological realities to this. And so we know that connectivity needs to continue to increase. You certainly don't want to create a, a bigger digital divide. We also know that things like the infrastructure and the, and the hardware need to be transformed. These are really big, meaty topics. And they're big, meaty topics for tech companies, for governments, and societies overall. Given that Asia Pacific is different from the other regions in the world, what has Meta done to localize their set of current services in the region? Yeah, we tend to take more of a personalization approach than uh, localization. And what I mean by that is when we roll out features or, or technologies, we tend to make them as widely as available as we possibly can. And we allow individuals or we use data to personalize them in ways that make the most sense. And so it's one of the reasons why your newsfeed would be very different than my newsfeed. You know, that said, 
when we do look across the region, a lot of the behaviors that we see in Asia, they've been inspirational to, to many of the products and the technologies that we've built. And so if you look at things like live shopping, which uh, really took hold of Southeast Asia and, and it is booming, we took inspiration from that. Things like conversational commerce or social commerce that's happening over messenger, that's a big deal. And that really came out of here or short form video. You know, there's lots of different examples. I can attest to that because I have a lot of interaction with WhatsApp for businesses with, for example, my daughter's Chinese school, or even whether it's hiring a plumber or somebody to help me to dispose furniture as such. So we lived for the past two years in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. How did Meta help small and medium businesses to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic? And I think one interesting aspect I would also want you to highlight is the efforts with your partner education programs and ensure vaccination confidence with communities in Asia Pacific. So just for starters, there is no doubt uh, that this has been an extraordinary time in, in history, and it's not clear that we're out of it just yet. But the one thing from a business perspective is clear is this acceleration of digital transformation. It is absolutely real. Now, across our platforms, we have over 200 million businesses that are active, and we saw all aspects of this playing itself out. And so there were businesses that were struggling to pivot during the lockdown measures, and many of them, frankly, didn't survive. You also have some businesses that are absolutely booming because things moved online. We also saw a lot of brand new business models develop during that time period. And so when I think about SMBs in general, I always like to illuminate it, a story of what I think is representative, which is think of your neighborhood restaurant and the journey that they've had to go through. And if you look, go back to the start of the pandemic, you know, the reality is many of these SMBs or, or in this case, a local restaurant, they didn't have much in the way of digital skills. So they, they had to, in a very short period of time, they had to figure out, hey, how do I digitize my menu? How do I put in place some type of mechanism for delivery? And then ultimately, what do I do to market myself where people are spending their time, which increasingly during the pandemic was online? That was a very tough journey for many of them. And, and again, many of them didn't make it. But if there was a silver lining in some of this is I think that there are a lot of great examples of SMBs that have picked up this digital skill set and they're using it to expand their business in ways that they would have never thought of prior to the pandemic. And one of my own observations is that when I look at particularly that segment of SMBs, it was the area that I think in the early stages of the pandemic, we were most worried about because big companies, you know, they've got lots of resources and so they could weather the storm, they could weather the challenges and they have the resources to make the digital transformation. Reality is, we noticed that many of the SMBs were the ones that moved absolutely the quickest. And now in retrospect, you can say, well, you know, that's because their, their livelihood depended on it. But it was a really interesting observation. Now, in terms of how we support SMBs, we really use a, a three-prong approach. And the first, of course, is we tried to make sure that we were supporting financially. And so we announced a $100 million grant for SMBs. And then we also sprung into action around digital training and education and whether or not that was with online summits or we have a formal program uh, called Boost, which does digital skills training. We also invested heavily in a program that I'm quite proud of called She Means Business, which is a digital training program which targets women in digital training because we know that in many respects, when you take a look at the impact of COVID, it was disproportionate on women. They had to pick up a lot of the household responsibilities with kids at home or homeschooling. And then really the third area that we looked at was from a product development standpoint. And so we went through this process of what are the important areas for business during this time? And that's one of the reasons why we rolled out things like shops, which is now available in 18 countries across the region. And also, how about the efforts with your partner education programs and the, to ensure vaccination confidence with the communities in Asia Pacific then? Yeah, I'm really proud of the work that we did in this regard. And I would categorize it in two different areas. We did a lot of work around vaccine confidence campaigns. We also did a lot to combat uh, misinformation. And so on the COVID misinformation side of things, we did a media literacy campaign, which we've launched in 32 countries. We've reached over a half a billion people. And then on making sure that we were developing the right 
partners for confidence in resources and credible information. We did a lot of work in partnering with governments and health ministries to launch things like chatbots, so WhatsApp and Messenger, that in many countries around the region have become a credible and, and regular source of information around COVID, but also vaccinations. So how have the different services from Meta, for example, e-commerce, video, and augmented or virtual reality, aka AR, VR, evolved? And what are the key trends we have observed in Asia Pacific? Well, first off, Asia Pacific is where all the growth is happening. And it's not just because this is two-thirds of the world's population in the region, but it's also because a lot of the consumer and business behaviors are just more pronounced here that are built around digital transformation. I recently did a uh, piece which highlighted the five trends that we're seeing across the region. And let me highlight the top line. So first, uh, number one is around augmented reality. So AR and VR. And clearly this is no longer just for gamers anymore. We are seeing a lots of creators publish some pretty cool effects across the platforms. An interesting statistic is we now have over 700 million people every month across the platforms that are using one of these effects. The second trend that we're seeing is around business messaging. It is more popular than ever. And what we're finding is that people want to connect with businesses the same way that they're connecting with each other, and that's via messaging. And so we're also seeing some knock-on impact of that. So as business messaging becomes more popular, things like commerce over messaging is also exploding. The third area is around mega sales day. What started out as singles day is now proliferated. So there's one, one, two, two, three, three. And you know, these days are turning into major cultural events and bigger and better than ever. The fourth area is around creators. So when you look across Asia Pacific, it is home to some amazing creators and their numbers are really growing. And so increasingly businesses are learning how to take advantage of this creator community to build their own business. And then the last is around video, and particularly short form video, but look, video overall has just exploded. And it's one of the reasons why you know, we've rolled out reels over the course of the last year to 10 new countries. Most recently, we rolled it out to uh, Philippines and Singapore. What are your perspectives in the adoption of AR VR given that Facebook has embrace remote working due to the acceleration caused by the COVID-19 pandemic then? So most companies are really having to deal a lot with the realities of remote working. I mean, that's just a byproduct of COVID and the related lockdowns. Now, we as Meta, we're leaning in big to this because we think a lot of this isn't going to go away. And in fact, we've gone public and said that we believe a very large percentage of our overall workforce will either be working part-time or full-time uh, remotely. Now, the big challenge with all of this is it's one thing to just talk about the communication that video calls provide, but it's quite another to think about more immersive ways to connect. So how are we building culture? How are we collaborating? And that's really where things like AR and VR could be a really big part of it. You know, as I've said before, we are building these experiences which enhance a lot of aspects of presence where a colleague can feel like they are together even when they're apart. And that's one of the reasons why we, we recently launched Horizon Workrooms. That's a super cool VR collaboration experience. It actually feels like you're right next to someone. So I think one key interesting discussion we have is to talk about the creator's economy. How does Meta help to build the community of developers in Asia Pacific and at the same time jumpstarting the creator's economy? Even though we talk about it as a trend in terms of it's, it's really accelerating, the reality is in absolute terms, it is still very much in its infancy stage. So that makes it kind of exciting. But uh, we are investing heavily. We recently launched a, a $10 million creator fund. And over the course of the next year, we'll invest that on everything ranging from things like community competitions to just straight up funding of developers. We're also spending a lot of time on our Spark AR platform. And that's the platform that many of the creators use to create these cool effects across the apps. We've also announced a $150 million investment over the next three years in immersive learning. The plan there is really to start to kickstart some of the AR, VR ecosystem around things like education and career development and even access to the metaverse. I run a podcast and I typically use my Facebook page to reach out to my audience. What are the tools that creators can now leverage to reach their audience and build their businesses on top of them? 
We are really investing as a priority around what are the, as you put it, the tools and the products which can really accomplish two things. We want to make sure that creators can earn a living. We also want to make sure that they can unlock new audiences. And so we want to make sure that when all is said and done, that creators are able to thrive across our platforms. And so by the end of 2022, we are going to invest $1 billion in programs that gives creators new ways to earn money on the content that they're creating, but also unlock these new audiences. And so if you're looking to build a new audience, you can use things like Facebook groups or Facebook Live or Instagram Reels or Stories. And if you wanna earn a living, you can do that via ads or fan subscriptions or paid online events. Can you provide some real examples of how content creators have built value through Meta in this part of the world? There are so many good examples, but I will give you one of my favorites. And I say this partly because it's top of mind because I just recently spoke to the uh, co-founder and that is the Bubble Tea Club. The Bubble Tea Club is an amazing story. It's a DIY business. It's based in Melbourne, Australia. Pam Yip is its co-founder and CMO. Her and her friend Jenny lost their jobs at the start of the pandemic. And that's really where things got interesting. Of course, they're looking for kind of the next thing to do. They needed income. And concurrently, they also had a pretty big craving for bubble tea. So that's where the idea came from. And since Melbourne was really in a very strict lockdown, both Pam and Jenny decided to launch a business to help people make bubble tea at home. And it's an amazing story because really in a, in a short period of time, in just four days, they pulled together the ingredients, they went out and filmed videos, they did post on Instagram and Facebook, and they connected with their customers via messaging. And now they have a $2 million business. And I think one of the things that really was profound for me is in this conversation that I had with Pam on this story of Bubble Tea Club, one of the things that she pointed out that was one of the most important learnings is that people just want to connect with a business. They're happy to support and feel part of the community, especially now during the pandemic, but they just want to be able to connect. And so I thought that was pretty amazing. That comes to a pretty interesting topic that I would like to dive a little bit deeper with you. So specifically in the Asia Pacific region, can you talk about the effort that Meta is making to tackle the inundation of information and reduce misinformation to people and communities within Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp? Yeah, this is a really important topic. And, you know, I, just to contextualize, you know, we've got nearly half the world's population that are on Meta's platforms. And we are seeing so many great stories from, you know, the ability to be connected. But we also know that there's those that are out there that want to abuse technology. And so one part of our role and our responsibility is making sure that we're taking steps to stop the spread of misinformation. And we usually try and use a framework of three different approaches. We want to make sure, number one, that we're removing it. We're removing content that violates our community standards. We want to make sure that we're reducing distribution. So we want to make sure that the stories that are marked as false, that we're reducing the distribution around those. And we want to make sure that we are informing people so they can decide what they want to read, what they want to trust, and what they want to share. So, you know, we work with, just from a fact checking standpoint, we have third party fact checkers. We work with over 80 of them around the world and that covers over 60 different languages. Now, if you put that into a very specific example, so let's take COVID and let's use the work that we did around that just over the course of the last year. And so during the COVID pandemic, we launched a information center and we did it with authorities like WHO and UNICEF and health ministries from around the region. We've now connected over 2 billion people to this reliable source of information. We also know that the chatbots, which I referred to earlier that we've partnered with many of the governments and health ministries to launch, that over 4 billion messages have sent to various helplines for information via that platform. We also know from the experts that things like knowing when some of your friends and family got vaccinated, that that's a determinant in whether or not you wanna go ahead and do that as well. And so that was one of the ideas behind this. We created this I'm vaccinated Facebook and Instagram profile frames, and we've now rolled that out to over 70 countries. And so there's lots of different examples. How are you working with the regulatory authorities in the region? So all technology companies, I believe, and particularly those that are at the heart of the digital economy, there's a real responsibility to work constructively to build a fair internet that really works for everyone. And that's why at Meta, we support global regulation. 
we just want to make sure that it's having the right balance. So we want to make sure that we're doing things that are improving trust, accountability, transparency, but also we want to make sure that we're protecting the internet that's used by hundreds of millions of people in small businesses around Asia. So we've proactively, as Meta, we've put uh, forward a, a number of different proposals around regulations across a range of issues, and whether or not it's on things like elections or harmful content or privacy or, or things like data portability. And so our approach, both in the region as well as globally, is, is we view it as very much collaborative with governments and uh, policymakers. We recognize just how complex the digital landscape can be. What are the complexities in navigating the difficulties of dealing with misinformation? I think one of the biggest areas is just understanding what is the source of truth. And that's one of the reasons why we've really gone out of our way to partner with uh, different fact checkers. As I mentioned before, we have 80 third party fact checkers and organizations around the world covering 60 plus different languages. And then the second area is around, well, what do we do with something when we suspect that it is misinformation? You know, when do you decide to remove it because there's the potential that it could create harm? When do you decide to label it? And when do you decide to allow people to share it or not share it? I think this is probably a very, very difficult topic and we have a lot more to talk about as the years go on. But I would be very interested to uh, come back to a more optimistic note given that there is so much excitement on the metaverse and creators economy with Meta. So I want to ask this, what does great look like for Meta in the Asia Pacific region for the next three years? I would go back to our mission and that is really built around helping people connect and building community. And so for me, great is when we're enabling people in communities to just do some incredible things on the platform. And whether or not that's things like raising money for causes they care about or supporting each other through difficult times or starting to grow their own business or, you know, bringing in the topic around creators. You have the ability to use those talents to actually make an income from a business perspective. We really look at the success that we have as being based upon the businesses that are active on our various technologies and platforms being successful. And so the more successful they are, the more successful we're going to be. So, you know, at APAC, this is where the action is. And, and you know, I've said it before, but this is uh, where the growth driver is going to come from, certainly for Meta, but we think across a lot of the various uh, digital industries. Just as you, I'm equally optimistic and look forward to what are the most interesting things that are going to be happening this year. Of course, the best days are always ahead of us. So since we are at the beginning of 2022, what are you looking forward to this year? I think we are witnessing one of the single most dramatic economic transformations in history. You know, the digital transformation is absolutely real and it's going to stay with us. And we're quite fortunate at Meta because we think we're in many respects right at the center of it. So we have a very unique role to play in the transformation. And in some respects, we view it as, as part of our responsibility, particularly in helping businesses adapt to what is the not so new normal and flourish. Mm. We are looking forward to the better days and hopefully we can all have dinner someday and have a quick chat on this. So then many thanks for coming on the show. And in closing, I always have two questions to ask. My first question is any recommendations that have inspired you recently? Sure. There's lots of inspiration. I'll give you a couple. So first off, I love Gary Vaynerchuk, otherwise known as Gary V. I don't know whether or not you or, or some of your audience follow him, but I think he's one of the most prolific content creators and he's a really experienced practitioner in helping businesses grow. And so I love his stuff. I also think he has one of the best understandings around the, the digital ecosystem. The second that I would recommend is there was just a TED talk that was released by James Ree and it, it was around the value of kindness at work. And I was really fortunate because I know James and we hosted a session with James with our APAC employees. And it just, that topic around the value of kindness at work, it really resonated with so many of our team and, and really resonated with me in particular. Gary V has actually been one of our high profile guests on this podcast a few years ago. So we actually have a pretty good conversation with him whenever he's down in Asia as well. So my last question, how do my audience find you? Well, naturally, you can follow me on Facebook or Instagram. I'm also on LinkedIn, where I have a Pulse column called Ideas That Matter. 
Now you can watch the new video series on our Meta for Business Facebook page. It's pretty interesting because it's it's really about the businesses and people across Asia Pacific region, and they're doing some amazing things. I always learn a lot. Check it out. And you can definitely find us Analyze Asia podcast on any podcast platform through our Facebook page, Analyze Asia. Leave a review, give us a five star rating on iTunes, and of course, tweet to me anytime possible. So, then once again, thank you for coming on the show, and I look forward to speak to you again on some new developments of matter in the years ahead. Sounds good. Thank you. Run it, run it.